Uh, I want to thank you for doing this. Um, I really appreciate it. It's just like, you know, uh, I don't really get to talk to people that work for like the CIA or just like agencies like that. And you always see it in the movies and stuff like that, but you don't really know what it's really like in real life. Mm -hmm. And um, so my first question to you is, what is uh, your job title? Sure. Um, so, yeah, like you say, you see a lot about it in the movies, but few people have ever really heard what the actual job title is. Uh, my job title was a case officer, or you can call me an operations officer. Those two titles are interchangeable. Sometimes you'll hear us referred to as a field operative, but that's not the official title. Um, but these are what I did were the guys that go into the field and, you know, steal secrets, uh, a spy, you know, and uh, Hollywood often calls us CIA agents, but I will tell you that there's nothing that will set a CIA officer's hair on fire quicker than to call them a CIA agent because we're wow. not. They're FBI agents. We are CIA officers. So if you ever hear somebody say CIA agent, you know right away they don't know what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. So what is the job description? What do you do? Uh, well... I mean, unlike, again, probably what you see in the movies, we don't go full Jason Bourne and, you know, jump through windows and beat up a bunch of people. Uh, the job is to collect intelligence. And um, by that, it means intelligence that's not open source and that's valuable to the U.S. government. So going to a foreign country and reading something in a foreign newspaper is not intelligence, right? That's considered open source. It has to be a secret and, um, you know, something that that government would not want you to know about. So an easy example would be like learning about another country's nuclear program or something like that, you know, a secret that they really would not want the United States to know about. Um, that would be my job and other case officers' job to uh, get that information. Um, no, especially when I was in high school, I never would have thought it was a possibility. I went to, uh, high school in the Midwest, in the state of Indiana, and, uh, I never would have imagined it was a possibility, you know, because like you said at the beginning, when have you ever had the opportunity to talk to a spy? It, it just doesn't happen. So, um, I mean, the earliest, I think... I realized it was a possibility was when I was in college and a uh, CIA recruiter actually came to my campus and gave a speech and then said, you know, if you guys are interested, you can apply online. And so I did. And um, they actually called me back one day out of the blue. And then the process started from there. Hmm. So what made you want to apply? Uh, well, I presume that you were I'm guessing you were probably born after 9-11, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, so you, unfortunately, grew up amid, amidst, like, the global war on terror and all of that. Um, whereas for me, like, 9-11 happened my freshman year of college. And so that had a major effect on everyone at the time who was an adult, you know. Um, and I initially wanted to... Uh, be an eye doctor but when 9-11 happened it kind of shifted the course for not just me but a lot of people and uh, I figured you know I might join the military I really didn't know what to do because I was only 18 but um, you know when that campus recruiter came I thought well hell this might be an idea and uh, I'll give it a shot what's the worst that can happen they say no Yeah, let me dispel that myth for you. Um, a lot of folks think that, uh, you know, you, you, you're sitting in a bar someday somewhere and a guy just comes up and slips you a piece of paper, you know, 
And, uh, you know, there's been movies like that with Al Pacino and Colin Farrell. And, uh, you know, it, it, that just doesn't happen. And the reality mm-hmm. is the CIA still is an arm of the United States government. So, you know, it still applies to the standards of, um, you know, the Freedom of Information Act. So when you apply for any government agency, uh, they are held accountable for who they hire and why they hire them. And so there's no such thing as like, oh, my grandfather was in the CIA, so I got in through the back door. The only way to get into the CIA period is to apply online because they have to keep a record of your application process so that if you want to know why you didn't get in and you file a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act request, they have to give that to you. And so it's really actually a repository as well of just everyone who's applying. It's all done online. Um, it's encrypted, of course, but yeah, that's the only way to get in. There is no back door into the agency. Mm, that's definitely something I never, I never knew. Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought it was like, like what you said, like, you know, <laughs> some other way. But, you know, that seems way too simple. But actually, it makes sense when you think about it. Yeah, and you know, a lot of people think there's all these secrets to it. The CIA is actually pretty transparent with who they want and how to apply and how to get in. I mean, they spell it out for you. You can go to like CIA.gov and they tell you exactly like, this is the age you have to be. This is the maximum age you can be. These are the types of things we look for and this is what we want and this would make you a better candidate. Like they tell you straight up, like, hey, this is our ideal candidate and if you fit this go ahead and click that little button right there and fill out the paperwork so there's no ambiguity on what they're looking for and what you need to do to get your foot in the door Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um what would you say you did on a daily basis i know it really like varies Mm -hmm. but maybe like in general what would you say um you did well it's like you said i mean it does depend and more than anything it depends on what your job title is and where you are in the world. Um, keep in mind, if you're, if you're a case officer like I was, you only work overseas in foreign environments. Like That's who you are. That's what you do. You go to foreign countries and you collect secrets and you run sources. That's, that's your job. It's like a detective you know, who works in a bad area of a big city he runs drug informants, you know, like it's, it's that, and and it's in a foreign country and it's in a foreign language. So, you know, no day is routine. Um, and you're usually operating on your own kind of lone wolf style. And, um, you know, you just have to kind of use your own guile to find people, um, that you think would probably know something of value. Like I said, that's a secret that's not readily available. And, um, yeah, just every day you're turning over rocks looking for uh, those guys who have some information that you think would be of value. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I'm guessing I can't ask you to like elaborate because that's probably like uh, something you can't talk about. You can. I mean, just be specific. Like, what specifically would you like to you know? Um, I don't know. Maybe just like how would you do that, I guess. Yeah. Well, look, again, I use the example of like an undercover cop, right? I mean, he is told by his captain or whatever, hey, um, there's been a spike in crack cocaine in this area of the city. Uh, We're seeing a rise in crack. Like, we want to stop that. So go undercover and find the crack dealers, find out where they're selling it from, monitor them, whatever, and we'll arrest them. So it's the same with me. You know, it's like, hey... We're seeing an increase over here in IEDs. If you if you're familiar, that's an improvised explosive device, bombs, um, which you know they plant in Afghanistan and Iraq and Syria and all those places. So your boss will say to you, you know, hey Doug, uh, there's been a lot of a, a great increase in IED explosions in this part of Afghanistan. So figure out where these bombs are coming from and put a stop to it. And so you have to, again, use your training and your wits and your smarts to figure out, okay, who's responsible for this? How are they doing it? 
and then map it together and figure out who is in the network and then ultimately how you're going to stop them or in my case, which is even better, how you're going to recruit them and get them to work for you and basically rat out all of their friends. You know, like like you see in the movies, like again, like the cops, they get they get that source inside the drug network. Well, I would get my sources within like the Taliban or Al Qaeda or ISIS to tell me what was going on. So it, it's very similar to police work, except we don't arrest anybody. <laughs> we we want them to continue to give us secrets into perpetuity. We don't ever want to arrest anybody. Um, so how would you say are accurate? Uh, how accurate are those movies? <laughs> um, very few are accurate. I have to be careful though, because I kind of work in Hollywood now, and I won't mention oh. I won't mention uh-huh. the show, but. A couple years ago, I gave an interview to a, a major newspaper, and I kind of made fun of one of the shows that's really popular about the CIA. And I won't do that uh-huh. again because I heard they got really mad that I did that. So, oh. so, but the reality is, like, almost none of them. But what I always say is, like, look, if you watch some television show, and there's tons of them about like the hospitals, right? Like ER with George Clooney back in the day, or whatever the popular one is now. If you're a real surgeon, you watch those shows and you're probably like, oh, come on. Like, that guy would die on the operating table if we did that, you know? Like, that's the dumb... Oh, you don't put the tube there, you know? So, like, it's the same thing when I watch CIA movies or anything. I just go, oh, come on. Like, that would get you killed, man. Like, jeez. But, uh... The one I did like, I will say the one I did like was Zero Dark Thirty, if you've seen that. So that was about as accurate as they can get. They took a lot of license and did, you know, a bunch of Hollywood stuff. But that was, that one was pretty good, Zero uh, Dark Thirty. Um, so what would you say uh, is like, okay, I don't know if you can share this or not, but what would yeah. you say is like one of your favorite experiences that you can share that's like unique to your profession? Oh, one of my favorite experiences. Um, mm, well, that's kind of twofold. I mean, uh, I'd say the most unique thing probably for my profession is it's really about the only profession in the world where um, you think you're being followed around all day long and you are. So... Uh, you know, it's pretty much the only occupation where you're not schizophrenic to think that you're being followed around all day um, because you usually are followed around all day. And um, I'd say that's probably unique solely to the world of espionage. Um, and, uh, I mean, it's it's pretty intense because if you are being followed around, you know, you're trained uh, by the CIA to know when somebody's following you, but you also got to determine who that person is that's following you you know is it the local cops or is it a terrorist group that is wanting to kidnap or kill you so you know that determines what you're going to do next so um yeah it's very unique and again the hollywood style of you know the james bond driving like an aston martin and getting out in a tuxedo you know and not ever looking over his shoulder and never never aware of his surroundings like it's the opposite of that. You know, you're going to drive a car that blends into the community and you're going to definitely be alert and aware of everyone around you because uh, somebody might mean you some harm. Mm. And what would you say is considered successful? So, yeah, how do you know, like, when you did good, I guess? <laughs> right on. Um the uh, success is measured in terms of uh, the intelligence that you collect, like how valuable it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, for instance, if you stop a terrorist attack, right, you can imagine you're going to be rewarded for that. And um, also the recruitment of assets or sources. So, like, again, to use the detective analogy, because most people in the U.S. understand that and have seen it and all the cop shows we have. You know, the more sources I get working for me, 
and giving me secrets about, you know, the drug operation they work in. Same applies in espionage. The more spies I have working for me and the more sources I have reporting to me, that's that's good too. So that's considered success. The more guys I add on to my roster, um, that you, you get rewarded for that in terms of like, you know, wow, this guy has a big network. Doug is managing a lot of people like, you know, he's, he's doing a good job and they'll notice that. Mm-hmm. And uh, going off of that, uh, what are some of the people that you work closely with? Um, do you mean that internal to the CIA or do you mean mm-hmm. like overseas or what do you, what is specific? Um, I guess like in general, like what are some other like, I guess, occupations that you work with to just like to do your job? Sure. Um, the intelligence community is pretty big. Um, so it, it really depends on what the mission is. I mean, there really is no day to day again, like routine, like, Oh, I know from like 10 to one, I'm going to need to meet with the FBI, you know, or, uh, Oh, I'll need to speak to, uh, the U S military at nine to 10 every morning, you know? So it doesn't work like that in so much as it's like one day comes along and somebody tells me, hey, there's an American involved in this terrorist cell. Well, when I hear that, the first thing I do is pick up the phone and call the FBI, right? Because we're talking about an American now and they're still subject to U.S. law. So, you know, it kind of just depends on the zeitgeist of the moment and you know, you just got to react. So, but again, you know, if you're in a war zone and it's, um, Hey, this guy is driving a vehicle with 200 kilos of explosives in the back. Well, then I'm going to call the Navy SEALs, you know, and go, Hey, you guys might want to track this one. So, you know, we have the capacity to work with anyone, uh, within the U S government, but, um, it really just depends on the event at hand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, what would you say is something that motivates you every day to continue doing what you do? Uh, I guess I'm going to be assuming it's like serving your country, but like, what are some other things that motivate you? Yeah, I mean, that's an obvious one. You, I mean, patriotism obviously plays a mm-hmm. underlying current, and it never really goes away. You wouldn't have joined otherwise because I can tell you it's not for the money (laughs) you you make federal employee money so it ain't that Um, so you get paid very little but that's not why you join if you join because of the money you wouldn't have joined to begin with you would have went to Wall Street you know so um, I mean as far as motivation for me it's not even just with what I used to do for the agency I mean anything I do now or will do in the future I got to be super passionate about it and um, if I'm not, if, I'm, if it's even tepid or I'm marginally interested, I tend to move off of it really quickly. Um, you know, I don't waste my time. So even if it's like reading a book, if you don't kind of have me hooked by the second or third chapter, um, you know, I'm a pretty patient guy, but if it's still not moving me and I'm not into it, I'll just put it away because I know there's so many books out there that I will like or even if something as you know innocuous as a television show you know if you don't if I waited 35 minutes and you still don't have me interested I'm gonna flip it to something else you know so um, but yeah anything I do um, I gotta really be passionate about it or I I just don't do it Um, and Sure. What are some traits that you really need to have in order to do your job? Uh, I'd say more than anything, you have to be able to deal well with ambiguity. Um, mm-hmm. and what I mean by that is like, I mean, you're dealing with humans, right? And they're entirely unpredictable. Like you can, you can say like, yeah, humans have patterns and maybe we're talking about some guy who gets up 
at the exact same time every day and eats the exact same cereal and clocks in at the exact same time and then leaves at the exact same time. And you can go, okay, well, he's really predictable. But what you can't predict are outside factors to his life and neither can he. So what if he finds out on his lunch break that he has cancer and that flips his entire world upside down? Okay, now he's entirely not predictable at all. Or, you know, the guy's spouse gets in a car accident. Everything goes out the window and you can't predict these outside factors from happening, you know. So I don't believe you can predict human behavior because you can't predict the outside factors from happening. And so you really have to be able to think extemporaneously on your feet so that when the sand shift, you're able to move accordingly. Because this guy that used to do ABC123 every day is now way off his rocker. You know, and you need to be able to respond to that and plan accordingly on the fly. A lot of the stuff you do might seem like you're flying the plane while you're building it, you know? And so, um, especially in terms of espionage, like there's going to be duress, there's going to be pressure, there's going to be all these external factors that can, you know, really weigh on somebody and, um, you never know when it's going to happen. So bottom line, if, if you don't, if you need somebody like holding your hand and you're the type of person who needs your boss telling you what to do on a daily basis, um, you probably wouldn't make a very good spy. You gotta be able to think for yourself. Uh, uh, and I guess, what are some like, I guess, physical aspects that you have to have? Like, do you have to be good with computers? Or do you have to, like, be athletic? Um, so what are, like, some other things like that that you need to have? Um, well, one thing is, obviously, when you have the word intelligence built into the name of the organization uh-huh. you work for, you got to be smart. Uh, uh-huh. but, but that's obvious, right? Like, mm-hmm. by proxy of walking through that door in Langley on your first day, Everyone knows you're smart, so you don't need to try to impress anybody with your intellect. Like, everyone knows you're smart, because they're smart. That's why you're there, right? So you can leave that portion of your ego at the door. But, I mean, there's so many different careers, and if somebody's interested, I really encourage them to go to CIA.gov, because it, it literally tells you, like, what the jobs are and what you do. I mean, it doesn't tell you specifically how we do it and what our, like, computer algorithms are obviously, but, you know, if you're interested in computers, you can find the Department of Science and Technology on the CIA's website, the DST, and it'll tell you, hey, we're looking for people who understand Python, and people who understand how to code, and people who understand, uh, you know, military level encryption, and it tells you exactly what they're looking for, somebody who understands search engine optimization, SEO, you know, all of that stuff, and, um, it's really crystal, it's not crystal clear, but you're not left to wonder like, you know, wow, what skills will I need? They tell you like, hey, if you want to be a case officer like I was, you need to be able to think on your feet and oh, by the way, you need to be able to speak well and communicate well with others because that's your job. So technical skills wise, you know, it, it, it can get extremely technical if you're working uh, in that field, um, in that division of the CIA. But, you know, there's also guys who kick down doors for the CIA. So that would be somebody who needs to be able to do 100 pull-ups and push-ups and run a six-minute mile. So it really just depends on what occupational track you're in. Mm-hmm. So would you say, which one would you say you were more of? You are more of like, you know, out there and kicking doors open or was you more like on the technical side? Uh, I was kind of in between, really. Um, I, I never try to fake the funk that I was, you know, some SEAL Team 6 guy kicking down doors. That's not what, it's not what I did. There are guys who do it, but more so like my job would be to find the sources. Like I said, you know, like, again, detectives finding, you know, a drug dealer. Find that guy get him to tell me everything that's going on 
so that I can then give that information to the guys who do go through the doors with guns blazing, you know. So my job was to run that network, find out everything I can so that we can stop those bad guys from doing bad things. Mm. And what would you say uh, is your advice to a teenager that wants to pursue your job field? <laughs> oh, advice to teenagers, huh? <laughs> right on, man. Um <laughs> Uh, let me give you a couple. Um, so job related, I would say, and I'd say this to everyone, learn a foreign language, travel overseas. You know, um, I know you're on Reddit. I'm on Reddit. Um, I've done a couple, ask me anything, you know, the AMAs and I get the same private messages all the time. Hey man, how do I get in? What should I do now? I'm 15 or I'm 16 or I'm 17 and what should I study in college? And I say, it doesn't necessarily matter so much what you study in college. Just learn a foreign language, even if it's Spanish. Learn it, like really learn it to the level of fluency that you can and try to travel overseas as much as you can um, because that's exactly what you're going to be doing if you're a spy, right? If you want to stay domestically and arrest people, go join the FBI. If you want to go be a spy, you're going to be overseas your entire career and you're going to be speaking a foreign language. So you're going to know multiple languages over the course of your career. You need to uh, master them. So I would say that. Um, Mm -hmm. Admin wise, I do have a piece of advice for teenagers (laughs) um, because I know you guys grew up with like a smartphone in your hand. Yeah. Um, which is fine because I'm on my phone all the time too. Everyone is, <laughs> but administratively, uh, for when you do start applying to like the job fields, uh, that are advanced like CIA or something like that. I just want to caution any teenager listening to this, that a email is not a text message. So if you, <laughs> if you are emailing, like somebody in their 30s or 40s or 50s and they're in human resources do not send them an email in all lowercase with like grammatical errors like you need to you need to pretend it's grandma you're talking to and like write it like a letter because all too often like you know especially like the hollywood cats that i have to deal with now and i do mean have to deal with they will send me like these like the the word i will be a lowercase i. And I'm like, oh, that's, are you 12? Like, what are you doing, man? Like, my niece knows to capitalize her eyes. Like, it's so unprofessional, man. So uh, there's yeah. that. But yeah. um, that would be my only administrative advice to a teenager, that emails uh, are not text messages. <laughs> yeah, I learned that the hard way when I did that to a teacher, and then he got really mad at me when I did that. I like, yeah. emailed him like that and he got really mad at me. <laughs> so yeah. I'm like, okay, from now on, I'm never gonna uh, write emails like that. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, my last question is yeah. what does the future look like? Like, what do you want to do or what do you want to keep doing? Well, um, I think you may know that I wrote that New York Times best selling book, uh, Left mm-hmm. of Boom. So, that was, mm-hmm. that kind of opened up the aperture for me. Um, after that, I wrote a television show for the Discovery Channel, and then I um, starred in that show. That was uh, 2017, I guess, probably. Um, and I liked doing it. It was pretty fun, and it's really, really easy compared to what I used to do. So, And it's not at all dangerous. So I like that, and um, there's been some interest in my ideas and the stuff that I write. Um, so I've kind of just been in Los Angeles for the past couple of years and, um, working on, you know, creating a new television show, um, currently right now. And so that's what I do. And I kind of just hop back and forth from New York to LA, but, you know, to be honest with you, like I said, I might lose the passion for it and I don't know when that will happen. Probably I'm sure at some point it will, I'll get a little bit bored of it. And I'll move on to the next thing, and I don't know what that next thing will be, Um, but as long as it puts a smile on my face, man, I'll do it, and that's all I really need. So, yeah, that's my short answer. All right, 
thank you. Um, that was Douglas Lauk, CIA field agent. Uh, not agent no, no, field no, field no. Field no. I fell for the trap. I fell for the trap. <laughs> Oh, CIA man, I'm going to blame operative. Matt Damon for that. <laughs> He's a CIA field operative, <laughs> and I definitely um, dispelled a lot of myths about that position. Uh, you know, you don't really... Uh, I, I guess, like, I learned that it's not as, like, I guess, a- action-packed, but there's, like, definitely a lot of interesting aspects to the job, mm-hmm. and it's Yeah. Um, so yeah, like one of the interesting things is like how you even apply for the job. Like you just go to a website. <laughs> it's not like secret, yeah. uh, you know, operation where you uh, recruit members or yeah. like recruit yeah. uh, back alley stuff. People. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, I just want to say thank you so much for doing this. And uh, again, I just want to say sorry for like the all like those mishaps in the beginning. That's fine. Like, No worries, but, Tila. Uh, yeah. Hey, man, I wish you All the right. best in life. And, um, you know, if you need something in the future, hit me up on Reddit and uh, I'll see what I can do. All right. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Bye bye.